I will be reading from John chapter 14, verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, uh, the works that I do, he, he will do also and greater works than these. He will do be, uh, because I go to my Father. Good morning, Mesa. So today, if you haven't noticed, it's Senior Sunday, like Joel said, but we've had a lot of young men that have been leading us in our worship, and it's just super encouraging, and it really just makes me super happy to see these guys that I've seen grow up, and I've known for a long time leading our service, and so it's just awesome to see that. Uh, so a few days ago, I watched this video with Joel. It was from the Jimmy Kimmel Show, and... Uh, they went out on the street and they asked people what the most impressive thing they've done was. And so when you're asked on the spot to think like through your whole life pretty much, and you have to think of one time that you think is the most impressive. And so you don't get very good answers obviously. And my personal favorite was a guy who said he saved a cat once. And so they asked him, okay, so what happened? And he says, well, it was walking along in traffic and I stuck my foot out and I saved its life. And he said, oh, so you saw it in traffic, you grabbed it. And he's like, well, no, I kind of just pushed it. And like, so your most impressive thing you've ever done is you kicked a cat. And he's like, <laughs> well, I wouldn't put it like that, but. And I think that's a hard question for us to answer. Uh, what is our most impressive thing? Because there's a whole lot of things that we think are impressive. But when we get down to it and we try and explain it, it might not be as cool or as impressive as we might think. Uh, someone who is impressive, though, is Jesus. And in the verse that Samuel just read for us, it says, if we believe in him, then we're going to do the things that Jesus did. We're going to do those awesome, impressive things. And one of the most impressive things I think Jesus did was he shared God's word with people, and he loved them. <coughs> uh, an important part of this verse that I think is kind of scary, too, is it goes on to say, and we'll do even greater works than these. And I think that's kind of hard for us to imagine doing something greater than Jesus did. And it continues, it says, because I'm going to the Father. And I think that means when Jesus was going out and he was preaching the gospel, he could only share so much of like what was going to happen. He could share with them the new covenant that was going to happen. He couldn't share them that it was already here or that he had died for them because he hadn't yet. And so when Jesus goes to the Father, it's talking about him being crucified and that covenant being complete and being created so that we can have eternal life. And we get that opportunity to share that message with other people. We get that opportunity to share a message that will bear lasting fruit. And so I try and think about, like, what can we take away from this? And I think that if we believe, then we're going to do these things. We're going to try and share Jesus with the people around us. <clears throat> but I think the opposite is also true. I think if we don't share these things, if we don't actively try to share Jesus with the people around us, then it kind of shows that we don't believe. And I, can th I think that's a hard thing to think. We can think, well, no, I really do believe. I just don't like speaking in front of people. Or I just don't like, you know, it makes me uncomfortable to share my faith, but that's what we're called to do. It says if we do, if we believe, we will do the works I've been doing is what Jesus says. And I think that's what he really means. Uh, so it makes me think of one of these. Hopefully you know what it is. It's a life preserver. Um, and they're used to save people that are drowning. And what this makes me think of is, uh, you know, if you're at a public pool and you have a life preserver and someone's drowning, are you going to throw it to that person? I would hope that you do, because you're probably the only one with the life preserver. Usually they only have a few. And if you don't, that person's going to drown. And it's really up to you whether they're going to drown or not, if you are the one holding the life preserver. And so, of course, we're going to throw it to them, because we see the importance in that. We see that their life is up to us to save. And so I see it as, why don't we share Jesus with the world that's drowning? They're drowning in sin, and they don't even know it. They don't know they're drowning, 
and they don't often want our help, but it's our job as Christians to share Jesus with them and trying to save them from their sin. And I know it's a much different thing. It's a lot easier said than done, like, oh yeah, just share Jesus with everybody. And it can be easy just to say that. But in both situations, there's a choice to be made. There's a choice whether you're going to throw it or not, and there's a choice whether they're going to take it. And whether or not they take it, it shouldn't matter if we try to share with them. We should try and share with them even if we know they're not going to take it. Because it's the chance that a soul could be saved if we try and love them and share them Jesus' message. So I want to read this parable that Jesus talks about. It's the wise and the foolish builder. It's in Matthew 7, verse 24 to 29. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Putting God's word into action should be our foundation as, our, as a Christian. In our Christian lives, that should be our foundation. And looking at this parable, we can see that one man chose to acknowledge that. He built his house on a foundation, and the other chose not to. He left it out. And so when you look at what a foundation is for, it keeps a house from sinking into the dirt unevenly or from shifting with the ground, and it can tear a house apart because the ground's soft and the house is heavy, or a building is heavy, and it'll sink through and it can rip up the house, but it also keeps the house grounded. It's attached to the foundation so that when there's storms and winds, it doesn't just blow over. And we can see, like, with skyscrapers, they make them really big because it's a really big building. So it shows, like, the foundation that we set up has to be proportional to the building we want to build. And you can see this foundation, you know, is going to be a really big building. You, you could not put your house's foundation under whatever building this is going to be because you could probably fit your house in this foundation. It's just, it's huge. And we understand for a building to be safe, it needs a solid structure to be put on. And so when we try to get closer to God and we don't have a firm foundation, we don't have that big foundation to keep us safe and to keep us firmly grounded, we fail and we fall flat and we're just like this foolish man's house. We just tumble over when the first tough situation comes through. When the first storm comes through, we just fall over. Both builders knew how to build a house is the important thing I, I want to I wanna push at. We can sometimes really think this foolish builder was like an idiot because he didn't put his house on a foundation, which it seems silly to not do that. But when you look at he built a house, it doesn't say he attempted to build a house or he built part of a house. He built a whole house. So at one point he learned what it took to build this house. He learned that, he learned all the steps to do it, what materials you needed. And so that means he knowingly left out the foundation. And so that's where he's foolish, is he has this knowledge, but he doesn't use it. So why does that really matter? I think that matters because we can be just like him sometimes. We have what Jesus tells us to do throughout the Bible. We have what he said in John 14, 12. You know, it says if we believe, we'll do the things Jesus did. And we know that we're supposed to go and preach the gospel to all nations. We're supposed to make a disciple. And we're supposed to take up our crosses daily. But we don't really do that every single day. We don't take up our crosses every single day. And so, at some times in our lives, we can be just like this builder, and we set ourselves small, little foundations, and when we do that, we can only live small Christian lives, and when we try and outgrow that small foundation we've set for ourselves, we fall, and it's not strong enough to support us. Sometimes we choose to follow what Jesus says, and so, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so sometimes we can be just like that foolish builder. We can dream small dreams for our Christian lives 
and we can't live to our fullest potential. So I have a question. Are we the wise or the foolish builder? I think a lot of us would like to say we're the, the wise builder, but it really comes down to how we live our lives. Obviously, knowing something and actually doing it are two different things. Uh, it makes me think of uh, the difference between knowledge and wisdom. There was a little thing I saw in knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. <laughs> There's a difference, and it's what you do with that knowledge. You know, we can all argue whether tomato is a fruit or not, but what you do with that knowledge of knowing is really important. If we keep living our Christian lives as the foolish builder, our faith is going to end up like this. It's just going to fall over. We're going to mess up, and we're going to face punishments. And when you look at this picture, it looks like it was somewhat a house. At one point, it was probably a house. It kind of looks similar. Um, But somewhere along the way, it faced a storm, and it fell flat. Its foundations, its support wasn't good enough to keep this building up. And if we keep our foundations small, we'll end up just like this building. But instead of just our houses falling over, we're going to face a much more severe punishment. I have one last verse I want to share with you. Um, because this can be kind of an intimidating thing to, to imagine that like we have to go out and we have to do these intimidating things and we have to try and be like Jesus every single day. It's Joshua 1.9. It says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Today as we leave, God is with us. And he's with us throughout the rest of our week and throughout the rest of our lives. And so it's our job to share him with the people we interact with. To throw that life preserver to those people we see that are drowning in the world and drowning in sin. So today as we go out, and this week as we go out, let's stop being the foolish builder. Let's become the wise builder together. Thanks. Good morning. morning. Today I'll be reading Psalms chapter 27, verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Is this on? Wait, did I do it? Ooh, hi. (laughs) Okay, before you say anything, don't judge me for not looking as good as Landon. I spent about two hours less in the gym than him, and he spends two hours in the gym. And I'm going to stutter a lot, just warning you right now. How's it going, everybody? Thank you for responding. I was nervous nobody would respond. (laughs) So I'm going to be, and notice I'm going to have amazing slide work, uh, PowerPoints, everything. This is my one slide. I don't have anything else. Um, But today we'll be talking about our journey with God, the path God takes us, the multiple paths we go, detours, roadblocks, everything. So, or at least what I thought of. So, first off, if you wouldn't mind turning with me, can we go to Numbers 32, 13? And I noticed on the way up here that my bookmarks fell out in my car, so you're going to have to bear with me. (laughs) Alrighty. So it says here, So the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wander into the wilderness 40 years, until the entire generation of those who had done evil in the sight of the Lord was destroyed. So, a little bit of context, Israel got out of Egypt, and they did not go into the promised land like God wanted. Ten were bad, two were good. So, they go, and they're like, no, we know better than you, Lord. We know where we're meant to be going. We know what we're meant to be doing. You do not. And so, God was like, oh, okay. (laughs) They just wandered for 40 years because they didn't listen to God. He had done all this. He had shown them so many signs. I mean, he had shown them a lot more than he shows us today. I I don't know about you, but I have not seen a pillar of fire appear before me. So, sorry, I'm nervous. (laughs) 
So God will take us, and we can be going down this path. We think this is the right path. We think that we know better than God, or maybe we think this is where God's leading us. And sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. On the times that we're wrong, maybe he'll force us to take the long way around to the path that he wants, right? I mean, has that ever happened to anyone's life? You're going where, God, where you think God leads you, and then he just makes you do a huge loop to learn a lesson. It's character building. That's what my dad would say. <laughs> All right, so I don't have a verse for this next one just because I personally, actually, I just couldn't think up a specific verse that it, like summed up all of him. But let's go to Joseph real quick, okay? Dream child, favorite child, coat of many colors, and sold by his brothers. That's what you get for wearing crazy fashion, kids. <laughs> all right, so what I really get from Joseph, okay, is that in everything he did, when he was sold, when he was a slave, when he was in prison, when he was second in command, he just tried to do the best for God that he could do. He tried to be the best Christian he could be. He tried to be the best of God's followers he could be. Sorry, not Christian. That's later on. Um, but he tried to be the best in everything he could be. Give God glory in everything. He's, he's like, oh, yeah, I'll just be the best prisoner I can be. What do you need? Oh, you want me to tell you what your dreams mean? Okay. I mean, if I was in prison for something that someone said I did, a false accusation, I don't think, sadly, the first thought coming to my mind would be, how can I serve God in here? And I mean, I think that's not a terrible thing for me to say. It's not what I should be doing, but I think that's something that us as humans, flawed beings, that's not the first thing that comes to mind, but this guy that's gone through all of this, that's the first thing that came to mind, that God will lead him onto the path that he needs him. He just needs to glorify God and do the best that he can do in everything that he's doing. All right, so next we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 17. Ooh, almost made it on the first flip. So 1 Kings 17 verses 1 through 6 where it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. And it shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and it shall command, and I have commanded the raven to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which was east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and the meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no more rain in the land. Okay, I read the seven there on accident. Okay. So, this is Elijah. Sorry, I get it mixed up. <laughs> so, this is Elijah, okay? Lots of stuff happens with him. Like, if you just go and you read everything with Elijah, it's, it's mind-blowing. Like, it's crazier than any fiction book I've ever read. So is Paul, but we'll get to that in a minute. But, like, it's insane. Have you ever just gone through the Bible and just read it like a book instead of reading it as in it's this is this testimony I need to focus just oh, I don't know sorry sidetracked love the Bible okay so the path that God's leading you right the path that he's leading him is he just causes this drought there's going to be no dew no water and now he has to go live by a brook I mean, it's like, come on, God, I really just stood up to them, and now I have to go live here and eat from the mouth of birds. But what I'm trying to get across with this is that the path that God is leading you, it may seem like a trap, it may seem like a dead end, it may seem wrong, you may be questioning God and his judgment. Didn't it work out for him in the end? Am I wrong in that? Okay? It worked out. God, God will provide for you in everything you do. You follow God, you worship God, you praise God, and you follow his commands, he will provide for you, he will protect you, 
We're his children. He clothes the flowers. Why are we worried? He feeds the birds of the airs. Why are we worried? Just follow his path. Next, we're going to Acts chapter 9, verse 3 through 6, where we're going to talk about Paul, like I said. Okay, Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. And it came about that as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and it shall be told to you what you must do. So, when I was thinking about Saul, I was talking with Joel about it, and I'm, I was just trying to figure out analogies to go about this. And first thing that really came to mind was, you always hear your parents say, God will open up a door for you. He closes doors, he opens doors. I think Saul was just going around just kicking down doors. I'm going in here. That's, that's where you want me, Lord, because I said so. Okay, so sometimes when you're going around, you're forcing your own path. You're forging your own path where God doesn't want you to go, okay? Because we got the short and narrow, and we got this wide path, lots of detours. The short and narrow, you're not really going to have those detours you can make. So you're going around, you're making your own path. Sometimes God's just going to be like, all right, no, and he blinds you for three days, okay? God will show you where you need to go. You need to put your faith in him, you need to love him, and just follow Okay, you need to open your ears. We are such a stubborn people. It is so hard for us to close our mouths for five minutes to listen to what God has to say in that gentle whisper. But if you do, God's going to tell you where he needs you. God's going to lead you where he, you need to go. God will tell you. It's not something you have to, as a person, as a flawed human, have to come up with. God will tell you. And that is an amazing thing. He's not leaving us stranded on an island. He's given us a map. He, he gave us a map right here. It's just up to us to listen to him, to put in the work in ourselves, and to follow him. All right, for my last example, I'll talk about Peter in Matthew chapter 26. So, talking about Peter, I never really thought about it as him lost. I know that's something that could just, like, snap, and that's super easy for you guys to think about. I never really thought about it. And then I look at this verse. So it's Matthew 26, verse 69 through 75. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a certain servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you were talking about. And when he had gone out of the gateway, another servant girl saw him and, and said to those who were there, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, surely you too are the one, are, surely you too are one of them, for the way you talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a cock crowed. And Peter remembered the words which Jesus had said, Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. God knows you're not going to go on his path 24-7. He knows you're going to get pulled away into these detours. There's going to be roadblocks put up. You're not going to know where to go all the time. God knows that. He understands that. He knows that we're flawed. If he didn't think we were worth saving, if he didn't think it'd be worth the effort of showing us where to go, he wouldn't have sent his son to die. But God loves us. We need to listen, and he will show us the way back onto the path. Okay? We take this detour, and then we take a side road. Okay? God will lead you back. Oh, you decide you want to take another side road? You can come back. Don't worry. No matter how many detours, side roads, turnarounds, whatever you get yourself into, God will always allow you to come back. He always has a place for you. He always loves you. 
It's just up to us to put in the work of listening, paying attention to him, of working hard for him, but also being able to be quiet and listen in that tiny, silent whisper. Thank you.